are in listen-only mode. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our webinar today on Audit Survival Guide and Safe Workstation. I'm your host, Syed Abidi, one of the Applications Engineer here at Associated Research, and um, I will be presenting the webinar. And um, just quickly want to introduce you to our rest of the team. We also have uh, Anthony Arroyo joining us as a panelist, who's also another Applications Engineer here, and he will be assisting you guys with uh, any questions that you may have on the material being presented, and you can uh, reach out to him you know, using the chat line, the Q&A chat line, and he'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, we also have Brittany, who's basically running the show, as always, the organizer, and also our marketing coordinator. We will also have one more person who you don't see in this picture, and his name is Josh. He's one of our business development specialists, and he's uh, going to be talking a little bit about our consultation services. Um, you know, uh, it's something new that we're starting, and Josh will provide some good details about it. And uh, before we begin, I just want to let you guys know that here in Lake Forest today, we're having, uh, you know, some bad weather, and we've lost uh, power. We've had power outages a few times already. So in case uh, something like that happens, I just want to make you guys aware that that is a possibility, although we're going to try our best to avoid that, but certain things are not in our control. So... Uh, let's hold on tight and hopefully we're not going to have any such issues. Okay, so as usual, um, our webinar, um, you know, is being recorded and it will be available for you to view in a matter of a couple of days. If you have any questions on, again, on the material being presented, use the Q&A utility. And if you have any questions on, uh, if you would like a copy of the presentation or if you run into audio-visual issues, please email Brittany or, uh, you know, uh, send her a message on the chat line. Her email address is brittany.socha at arisafety.com. Okay, I think we have enough people uh, so that we can go ahead and start. And here's a look at what we will be trying to cover. This one's going to be a relatively short webinar, uh, not much to cover, but some really important topics. So um, here's a look at uh, what we're trying to do today. Um, basically, we're going to show you guys uh, or, you know, discuss how you guys can survive when you guys, uh, you know, when your company is being audited. Auditors, you know, can be of, you know, or can belong to many different agencies such as UL, OSHA, and they're looking for many different things. And we're going to cover some of those things and see how we can help you guys, uh, you know, um, get away with any kind of audits that you run into, uh, especially when it comes to electrical safety testing related uh, stuff. So what are the auditors looking for? Qualification, first of all, you know, most, uh, um, you know, organizations, when they acquire any test equipment, you know, they have to run through a qualification and validation procedure, um, and it's uh, normally no, you know, known as IQOQ. Basically, it's a process of uh, you know, finding the right piece of equipment based on your requirements and then purchasing that equipment and then you know, actually installing and operating it and then validating it that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do and it's, uh, you know, it's fulfilling their test needs. We will then talk about a little bit on, you know, instrument calibration and verification, how these two important steps can, you know, um, prevent a lot of problems with your electrical safety testing uh, as you start using it. Then we're going to touch up a little bit on safe workstations, you know, how um, the kind of resources we have of, uh, you know, in helping you guys set up a safe workstation and having all your employees trained with, you know, with the appropriate information on how to use the test equipment and how to, uh, you know, practice, uh, you know, safe, uh, sa you know, safety regulations. We're also going to touch up a little bit on OSHA. Uh, basically, you know, OSHA is uh, more common in the USA, obviously. So we're going to talk about what OSHA can do, how, how they can interfere, and when are they uh, needed. Then we're going to talk a little bit about software validation, data capture, and collection, because that's also something that the auditors may be looking for. They want to make sure that you have a, a you know, a smooth process of, uh, you know, running your tests and also capturing 
the data and you know having some traceability and then we're going to talk and uh, you know at the same time while we talk about the things that auditors are looking for we're also going to show you how we can help you you know how we can help you prepare and have the right tools to you know to deal with any types of audits that you that you may experience and then uh, we will have Josh uh, you know uh, interject a little bit in the, towards the end of the webinar to talk about our consultation program and how we can you know help you guys uh, with any type of audits or you know training education knowledge a lot of good things so when you're getting audited when a company or an organization gets audited there could be auditors from different agencies really depending on you know what you know which uh, NRTL which is nationally recognized you know test lab you are working with or your you know which test standards you're looking into you may be looking at UL test standards so an auditor from UL may be looking for the you know for some of the following uh, things like production capacity process controls you know preventive maintenance and rework assembly processes storage handling automation software validation instrument operation and then you know all the qualification procedures and obviously these procedures need to be well documented and uh, you know they they must be in accordance with the test standards whereas an auditor from OSHA you know which is the Occupational Safety and Health Association um, they can be look you know they, they look for different kind of things they're more to work geared towards the safety of a workstation or safe work practices in general and the um, you know the qualification and the knowledge of uh, all the employees who are going to be using or be in the area where you know um, electrical equipment is being utilized so the one thing the good thing about OSHA is that they will never uh, you know show up and this is again only meant for the uh, you know companies organizations in the US they will not show up unless somebody one of the employees or somebody from the company or the organization calls OSHA and you know um, actually launches a formal complaint uh, regarding an unsafe work practice or an accident or something that they felt uh, was unsafe and didn't feel safe in the work environment or you know at the facility only then will OSHA you know pay a visit so Safety in general uh, means, you know, safety procedures, safe work practices. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, the responsibility of all employers to ensure uh, that, you know, safe work practice practices are being uh, implemented and enforced and that all employees are well trained to deal or use the equipment, um, you know, that they're supposed to. And at the same time, it is the responsibility of the employer per OSHA it is the responsibility of the employer to provide all the necessary uh, PPEs in other words personal protective equipment and um, you know tools to make a test environment or work environment from all, for all employees safe so again when you get audited you know a few things you want to consider are First of all, your electrical safety test setup and procedure can be very complex. So you want to make sure that, you know, first of all, you have it set up correctly and you, you know, it must be in accordance with the test standards and safety guidelines provided by, you know, various different NRTLs and, you know, safety agencies like OSHA. And you want to make sure that all your employees are well trained to use this equipment. Um, obviously the equipment must be validated uh, you know the software must be validated and all operators must be fully educated uh, you know with the hazards of using all this equipment as well as you know taking any preventive uh, measures so when you again you know when you get audited there's some key uh, items that you want to focus on first of all safety now uh, obviously as an employer and as an employee we all want you know all our employees to be safe and um, be able to you know um, make sure that others are safe as well it's not just your own safety but it's the safety of others for example if you have a workstation if a technician has a workstation and you know um, it's his responsibility to make sure that you know um, all the safety measures are being taken and there are no hazards present on 
that that technician's desk or bench or test station so that if somebody else was to walk up or, or you know stand by or close by his uh, his or her desk or bench you know there shouldn't be any safety hazards associated uh, you know around around that area so what's important here OSHA guidelines and European norm standards they dictate the safe work practices if you look at you know EN 50191 or BS or EN um, you know 5191 uh, it's it talks a lot about setting up a safe workstation and how you know how to avoid any any accidents in a workplace so there's basically uh, you know uh, full standards out there only focused on safety of workstations and setting up a safe workstation operator knowledge training so it is very important that you know, you know before you know or after once you've acquired the necessary hardware for testing uh, you know all the guidelines must be followed in accordance with these standards because they provide really good information and then you know it's very beneficial you know in the long term because if you can avoid any you know accidents in the workplace you know it, it just uh, makes things a lot more easier it, it you know it avoids a lot more like legal issues going forward injuries fines litigations are even you know in in you know when you're dealing with electricity um, some accidents do result in fatality so obviously that can you know lead to much bigger things and bigger problems for an organization so it's very important to you know focus on safety next is validation obviously in um, any other uh, whether it be UL or you know coming from any TUV or any other agency uh, wants to make sure that your this test system or the hardware that you've acquired for testing is functioning within the stated specifications and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, you know the uh, the qualification procedures uh, you know in one of the other slides but I just want to touch up a little bit here and uh, you know the implications for failure with validation could be that products are not properly being tested obviously if a test system is not configured correctly or set up correctly you know it, there's a big chance that the products being tested uh, you know may have passed uh, you know falsely so you may have some bad products that may just you know pass so there's a lot of uh, you know um, items that you need to uh, take into account and last thing is education Obviously, you know, you know, like I've mentioned already a few times, that operator education is is key, is very important because, you know, any operator who's using a piece of test equipment or any hardware test, you know, a test system, or even the software, you know, must know exactly what they're using, what it's capable of, what are the safety or you know hazards associated with it, and you know what how can things be prevented so education and training and knowledge is key to ensure that you know a, an organization that does not run into problems and uh, you know does not have to have OSHA pay them a visit so you know um, you can you know if, if if all these three key items are not you know uh, considered and you know given the due importance uh, you know things like losing a safety mark or product recalls litigation you know injured users a lot of legal issues can arise uh, going forward for any organ organization and we have seen you know uh, uh, in the past that some some companies or departments of a bigger organization were shut down because they it you know some some end user got injured using one of their products and they had to do a big recall you know pay the penalties the fines in some cases the department or the company actually got shut down so that's why you know we designed this webinar just to make you guys aware of the kind of things that can happen and the kind of things you need to be aware of and how we as a provider of electrical safety test equipment can assist and help you guys prevent all these uh, you know problems with that, we're going to um, give you a quick quiz question, and obviously there's some things we're going to talk about going forward, but, you know, the first quiz question, or sorry, first quiz question is, um, what practice should you complete before starting your training? 
and the options are calibration, hydration, verification, or have a cup of coffee. Coffee. So take a few minutes and uh, you know please participate in this uh, quiz, and then we will discuss further. All right, Zayed, the mm -hmm. polls are in, and it's 25% calibration and 70% say verification. Awesome. Thank you, Brittany. All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this poll or quiz question. And uh, it turns out that 25% of you uh, um, chose calibration and 70% of you chose verification so obviously verification is what we were looking for calibration is also very important but that's not something that you do um, every time you start using a test equipment and to to perform some testing it is instrument verification which is very important before the start of each shift or each day however you know you guys uh, feel comfortable we know some of our customers they like to uh, run a quick verification test before each start of each shift so maybe you know three times a day and then there's there are those who like to just verify the test equipment once in the morning and then they can use it uh, you know um, with a peace of mind in the in, you know for the entire day so obviously it was a verification and cup of coffee is also very important obviously if you ask me but I think verification would be the best choice here so then let's talk about calibration and verification some of these things here um, calibration as we all know and you know most of us being in the industry in this market we know what is calibration it's basically a process or procedure of verifying if an if a test instrument or hardware or piece of hardware is functioning properly and within specifications so for example you know we as a manufacturer of electrical safety test equipment we provide all technical specifications of our you know of any of our different you know different models um, of test instruments and if you look at the you know specifications in the catalog or in the user's manual you'll see there's a lot of accuracies listed with each uh, you know specification whether it's an output current voltage metering measurement you know resistance uh, you know anything that's related to our equi equipment and these accuracies basically define that how you know by how much will these values differ you know or by it basically gives a range you know it's like two percent of uh, setting two percent of reading plus minus a few counts uh, which basically tells us that you know if you for example if you set an output voltage of a thousand volts for you know for a high test or an insulation resistance test the accuracy will come into play and there's a bunch of different accuracy there's one for setting and there's one for measurement or reading you know uh, and all of these need to be taken into account but when it comes to calibration basically calibration is making sure that our the hardware is uh, you know within that range of accuracies that we are providing now calibrations can be of many different types and we you know we do offer you know different types of calibrations depending on what region you are and what are the requirements for you know for your specific instruments and what kind of calibration uh, data is your auditor looking for the other thing is um, we recommend as a manufacturer of equipment we recommend annual calibration now we have some customers who are you know who just want to take the extra step on and they try to get their instruments calibrated on a six monthly period maybe because their auditor is pretty strict and you know the auditor gives them a hard time or their you know usage uh, you know is very high volume uh, they may be in a very high volume production environment and the instruments are being used a lot more you know a uh, non-stop so they're very worried about you know instruments losing calibration which they don't normally unless you know there's some kind of damage or something else you know significant 
uh, event happens within the instrument or you know like a power outage or something like that you know uh, that can cause some calibration to be corrupted but other otherwise you know our instruments we don't uh, you don't see any calibration issues for a year so again in the end it's up to uh, you know the the employer or the manufacturer um, that how often they want to get their instruments calibrated um, as uh, as associated research you know we we do provide many different types of calibration services uh, that includes you know calibration certificates before and after data we have accredited calibration with measurement data and uncertainty uh, you know traceable to NIST which is the National Institute of uh, you know uh, calibration or something like that um, and then um, here's a list of uh, the different types of calibration that we can provide, the ISO 17025, the ANSI Z540, uh, the CTL spec sheet, and also the Denon's Law. Now, for example, um, any hardware, any test equipment being utilized in Japan or being shipped to Japan, you know, most of our customers want Denon's Law calibration. So, again, we have, uh, like I said, different types of calibrations. Uh, based on the region you're in and the standard you're trying to, you know, comply with. So again, calibration is very important. Um, auditors will ask you for calibration or can ask you for calibration certificates, uh, you know, uh, valid calibration certificates, meaning that, you know, if, uh, if uh, you know, um, the most recent, recent certificates. So if you've got your instrument calibrated, you know, in the past six months, they want to make sure that the dates are correct and also the instrument itself, you know, uh, most of our instruments do display calibration dates and also alerts. So the good thing is, you know, once a calibration date is approaching, you can set an alert so that it's going to, you know, start uh, alerting you every time you power the hardware on or power the instrument on, it'll give you a pop-up message, hey, calibration is due in a month, two weeks or something like that. However you want to set your calibration alert feature. So that helps and again, a very important uh, thing to keep in mind uh, that calibration is something that the auditors will most likely ask for and if you are not able to provide valid calibration certificates you may get written up. The next thing is uh, uh, verification which was obviously the correct answer for the quiz question and uh, this is different from uh, calibration where calibration is just verifying that the instrument is, you know, within its specifications and all the accuracies and ranges are, are, are being met. Verification is a way of verifying or making sure that the instrument's uh, failure detectors are working, meaning that, you know, an instrument is catching a failure when, a, when there is a failure and it's passing an instrument when it's a valid pass. So, you know, an electrical safety test is only as good as the test instrument itself, meaning that if the instrument is bad, obviously there's no point in, you know, all the tests that you're going to perform uh, unknowingly that the instrument was bad, th those tests won't be valid because you may, you know, a bad instrument, you know, may result in passing products that were, were originally supposed to fail or th that must be bad, but, you know, a bad instrument a uh, bad test instrument can pass those bad products and obviously then we all know the kind of problems or troubles that can lead to. So verification is again a simple way of checking if the failure detectors are working correctly. Um, there's, you know, if you look at the test standards, you know, from different, uh, you know, NRTLs or agencies, uh, you know, there's never been any mention of verification only until recently and when I say recently, in the past, uh, I would say, six to four, four to six years, we've started to see some, uh, you know, some of the agencies like UL actually mentioning or having a standard or actually mentioning somewhere, you know, on their website or somewhere on, you know, in different various standards that they've published, the importance or the need of verification. So this means that now auditors can also look for or ask you for instrument verification and ask you how did you how do you know that your instrument is working and you know, correctly and it's passing and failing products correctly and what is your uh, uh, you know process of verification how do you verify what do you use and you you know are you logging all the verification data as well so 
recently test standards have started to mention the importance of instrument verification and this is why associated research has come up with you know uh, some tools some some equipment that you can use along with your test equipment to uh, perform this verification and uh, we're going to look at that shortly um, some manufacturers you know like to perform instrument verification again daily or before every shift we, uh, you know, we do offer certain different types of load boxes, uh, for example, the TVB2 box or the LVB2 box, and here's a quick look at what I'm talking about. Um, the TVB2 box, which is our, you know, test verification box, is basically a load bank. It's got different loads, different, you know, combination of resistors inside of it, and it is also CE listed. So, again, that's very important because you know your equipment may be CE listed but the you know your test equipment but the, your verification equipment or loads if they're also CE listed it's gonna you know make your order a lot more you know uh, satisfied and uh, you know only because of the fact that it's CE listed you know makes a huge difference when you're using a uh, you know a piece of hardware so the TVB2 has uh, you know uh, different ports for different types of tests including the ground continuity ground bond, insulation resistance, and then the, the withstand voltage test or the high pot test, AC and DC. And it's got a pass fail, uh, you know, um, port for each of these types of tests. And it's a very simple connection. Basically, I'm going to give you an example of a high pot test verification. So all you need to do is you you got to connect your high pot um, tester, high, you know, high voltage output to either the pass or the fail connections on the TVB2 ACW DCW section and uh, you know the return connection to the common return port in the center and you're going to set up the voltage um, according to the spec sheet of this uh, box and um, you're going to run a test and that and you're also going to set up the high and low limits based on you know the specifications uh, per the TVB2 and uh, if you're connecting, if you're doing a fail verification, that should result in a fail. And if you're doing a pass verification, you know, you change your test settings and run a pass verification the same way, you should, the test should result in a pass. This is basically what we mean by verification. You're, you've just verified that your instrument catches a failure when you're actually setting up a test for a failure and your instrument's catching a pass when you're setting a test up for a pass. So again, this is a good way of verifying using external load um, to make sure that your instrument is, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, or the failure detectors of your instrument are, you know, functioning the way they should. And similarly, for all the other set test types, the setup is very simple. This is very simple to use, and, you know, there's not nothing complex about this box. It's just simple. It's just like using a simple resistor, but the fact that we have everything uh, in one box and you can, you know, um, use the same box for different types of tests and it's CE listed does make a difference and we know for you know from our experience and you know getting feedback from our customers that this box really helped them satisfy their orders. The other uh, again you know um, the, la the TVB2 was meant for all the test types but the leakage current test so we have something since the leakage current test on its own is such a uh, you know could be a very detailed oriented test you know within the leakage current test there's so many different types of leakage current tests that we decided to you know we uh, come up with a verification box just for the leakage current portion of your test instrument um, obviously you know that we you know associated research has uh, you know a few different types of leakage current test instruments well, one where you can, you know, have the leakage current test along with all the other tests in a one box solution, or we have standalone leakage current test instruments. And uh, this, uh, the LVB, the LVB2, which is the leakage verification box, leakage current verification box, um, is meant to run the verification uh, for the leakage current part of your testing. And as you can see from the picture, it's got many different test points and loads and pass-fail conditions, connections for the probes, you know, different connections for, and then, uh, you know, uh, connections for the terminals, DUT input power, probe I and probe low. And, uh, you know, the reason we have so many different checkpoints on this is that uh, because if you look at the leakage current test, there's, you know, um, there's your earth leakage, there's your, 
enclosure leakage, there's your patient leakage, patient auxiliary, applied part, mains and applied part. So many different types of leakage current testing or tests. And all those, if you look at the test standards, for example, if you look at the medical standard, the 60601, um, it specifies, you know, different ranges of uh, currents and for pass-fail criteria for diff each of these different types of leakage current tests. So this box is basically based off of, you know, uh, something around those values. So obviously it's not just meant to, you know, satisfy your 60601 standard, but it can be used with any leakage current test instrument uh, as long as, you know, uh, it's capable of outputting the necessary voltage. and uh, this box will do, again, you know, it's going to help you uh, with your audits. The auditor can take a look at this and you can kind of explain them. Um, we use the box with loads that are based off of the 60601 standard or other, st other test standards. And, uh, you know, it's got multiple different settings. So, again, the, you know, the important point here is that it's, it's a one-box solution for, you know, for di many different types of uh, verification uh, needs. And again, this is also CE listed, so that makes things a lot more easier as well. Um, so now let's talk about safe workstation. So we've covered calibration, verification, and you know um, a little bit of uh, qualification procedures. But now let's talk about safe workstation. Obviously, we have uh, you know we have a lot of good uh, you know material and uh, suggestions, you know white papers and a lot of knowledge base, you know, within our company, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, how a safe workstation can be set up. Obviously, there's many different ways, you know. Now, this is where, you know, standards like the BS EN50191 for, you know, setup of a safe workstation and agencies like OSHA, this is where they come in because they want to make sure that, you know, a safe workstation is being uh, utilize and uh, safe work practices are being used and implemented and these are essential to operator safety. So again an auditor may also want to make sure that you know all the necessary safety precautions are in place. They can write you up if they feel there's a you know a safety hazard present somewhere or if somebody launches a complaint. Um, you know the, the focus of these standards you know uh, there actually are obviously standards like OSHA's uh, 1910 subpart S, and these are in place that focus primarily on setting up of uh, you know safe workstations and employee education and qualification, and they make it very clear that it is the responsibility of the employer to provide all the necessary tools and equipment to their employees to make sure that they are they have all the safe. Uh, safety tools and you know their and it's it's the responsibility of the employer to uh, implement and enforce all the safety guidelines obviously different companies and different organizations have different safety guidelines different you know obviously all the test setups are different they're arranged in a different you know um, unique manner and you know from our field experience we've seen you know many different types of uh, you know um, work areas or testing Hey, Syed, we can't hear you. Okay, I think we can hear you now. Try again. All right. Yeah, uh, we can sorry hear Sorry about that. I think we lost. Okay, we lost connection here. So I was talking about the safety, uh, you know, uh, safe workstations. And again, um, you know, based on um, agencies like OSHA, they will, um, you know, they will come in if somebody, you know, launches a complaint. Um, you know, I was reading a case study, you know, for an organization where there was a accident in the workplace and it was not, you know, uh, they didn't bother telling the, uh, the authorities or, you know, the HR or, and, you know, any of the managers didn't know about it, but the, one of the technicians uh, just decided to call OSHA without telling anybody else and then OSHA pays a visit and writes up the company, you know, gets them into a lot of legal problems and obviously that can result into, you know, um, some costs, high costs to, you know, or penalties. 
So uh, if you look at this image, you know, in this picture, there's a few things I want to point out, uh, you know, that makes this uh, a safe workstation. First of all, there's, um, you know, there's an e-stop switch, which is controlling um, the power to uh, the uh, different hardware that's being utilized. So if somebody else sees a, you know, a safe uh, and, you know, an unsafe situation or somebody getting shocked or in trouble at the workstation, they can just hit this, uh, you know, e-stop switch to cut power to the station or to individual hardware that's being utilized to protect the, the operator who's standing on a uh, insulation mat. Obviously, these mats are important when you're performing high voltage testing because you want to, you want your operator or if you're performing the test, you want yourself to be, you know, isolated from ground and not provide a path for any, you know, fault currents to go through the operator uh, to ground. So this mat is, again, very important when it comes to high voltage testing and, uh, you know, we do have uh, um, these mats available that are tested for a very high voltage and, you know, if you need information on these, feel free to contact us. The other thing is, uh, you know, the signal tower light that's labeled E and obviously this is important not just for the operator performing the test, but this is more for people around the, the you know, this workstation. Obviously, again, like I mentioned, you know, it is the responsibility of the test uh, operator to make sure that, you know, there are no safety hazards associated around his or her test station. So you want to keep everybody else safe as well, uh, not just yourself. And uh, in order to do that, you want to make sure that, you know, you're providing at least a 10 feet distance, you know, from where you're performing the test, and in, which means that, you know, anyone else who's not, uh, you know, a part of your workstation uh, cannot uh, walk by close enough so that they can, you know, get in contact with any exposed conductors or high voltage or current. So maintaining a 10 feet distance from everybody else is essential. And this number is actually taken out of, you know, the, the 50191 or the OSHA standards. And they actually mention a, maximum, a minimum clearance distance of 10, uh, 10 feet. Um, the other thing is, I don't know if you can clearly see this, but the number the thing labeled as either A or H shows a, um, a DUT enclosure, which means that the device being tested is inside of an enclosure. And, or, you know, and obviously this enclosure should be plex something like made of, uh, you know, an, uh, an insulating material like plexiglass, wood, or something. And again, Associated Research has a few, couple of different types of enclosures, you know, and as long as the device under test can fit inside this enclosure, obviously it's, 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 it's something that we highly recommend. And the good things about these enclosures is uh, also that they connect directly to the safety remote interlock of our test equipment. And if somebody by mistake op tries to reach out for, you know, for the device being tested, or they have to first open the enclosure door. And as soon as you do that, if the test was, uh, running and if the instrument test instruments was outputting high voltage or high current, um, the opening of the door will actually break the interlock connection which in turn will abort the test and cut the output uh, whether it's voltage or current. So again a, a very effective means of providing protection to the operator and those around uh, in the test area. And then we have you know all sorts of uh, you know, safety warning signs for high voltage or, you know, um, you know, hazard, uh, safety hazards present in the area. There's many different signs and again, OSHA and, you know, uh, 5191 standards, they provide, you know, a whole list of uh, these warning signs depending on the specific uh, test application you're, you're, you're running into. So again, uh, kind of repeating myself here, all it's, you know, all manufacturers must implement internal safety procedures. Um, you know, our product manuals contain all the necessary warning signs and cautions for user protection. So we highly recommend you guys, you know, when you buy or purchase or acquire a piece of test equipment from, from us, do look at the manual, do read the manual, because that's your best resource of finding uh, out or learning what this piece of equipment is capable of, what what it can output and what are the dangers associated with it and what precautions you need to take. 
and then again, once again, I'm going to reiterate this, that it is the responsibility of an organization to implement and enforce work practices and provide all the necessary, uh, you know, PPEs. And here's a little excerpt from o directly from OSHA 1910, and again, that's basically saying the same thing that I have been, uh, you know, uh, emphasizing on, that employer employ employers are responsible for making sure uh, safety practices are being enforced and implemented. The last thing I'm going to talk about here before I'm going to introduce uh, Josh are qualification procedures. Now, these are integral part of any organization when they acquire new test equipment or instruments. Basically, uh, you know, uh, qualification procedures can be split up into, you know, three or four different types, IQ, OQ, PQ, there's uh, there's another one which comes before IQ, and that's when you're actually you know determining um, your test needs and actually looking for the appropriate test equipment. But uh, you know where we can really help you are the IQ, OQ, and PQ, simply because you know IQ uh, uh, basically stands for installation qualification. So once you've acquired and purchased the test equipment. You want to make sure that, you know, it's basically a means of evaluating uh, or accommodating, you know, new equipment and testing its materials and making sure that this, uh, you know, um, the, the hardware or the test system that you've acquired is meeting your needs and it's, you know, um, is, is the appropriate test system for your application. Then we have the OQ, which is uh, operational qualification and basically it's like, uh, you know, essential in challenging your, um, you know, test equipment and making sure uh, yeah, that your equipment parameters are in place. Um, at when you know at the stage of the OQ, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, operation qualification, you're basically um, verifying that your equipment is going to run, you know, um, and draw a specific amount of power. You want to verify that equipment is achieving those operational parameters. Uh, you know, and requirements, and uh, then and then the next phase is uh, you know um, PQ, which is your production qualification, and uh, you know, oh, sorry, performance qualification, and this is where you've actually installed and you know you're actually testing samples of your product and recording the data and making sure that you know that test data is me you know is uh, you know within the specifications of your test standards so it's a long procedure and you know I don't want to go into too much detail but what I do want to emphasize on is that when organizations are performing these procedures they look for help from the instrument manufacturers as their best resource and that's us for you guys because we are the manufacturers we're the we're the experts uh, you know, on our own products, and we know our, you know, the limitations and, you know, uh, um, all the necessary information uh, on our products, and we can really help you guys uh, make this qualification and validation procedure easy and, you know, trouble-free for you uh, just by our knowledge of our uh, products and all the material and all the paperwork that we have, you know, that you guys can utilize. So, um, you know, um, with our cons and then we also have our consultation program which we just recently started and then you know with our consultation program we can actually visit you guys and you know help you um, you know while you're actually running through your IQ, OQ and PQ we can be at on site and we can you know uh, assist you um, and train you with various different things and provide you all the necessary tools, training, knowledge uh, and, and you know uh, that you would need to uh, perform these qualification procedures and document them because documentation is essential here since you know uh, auditors will want to look you know they will uh, ask you to show a well documented qualification procedure and they will ask you questions like how do you know this equipment is meeting your needs so you have to present them with data and all the you know paperwork uh, that you've prepared uh, during this qualification procedure. And uh, since I've already talked a little bit about our consultation program, I think um, this is the right time to introduce our business development specialist uh, who's focusing on our uh, consultation program, uh, Josh, and he will take my place for the next uh, few minutes and go uh, you know, into a little bit more detail about our, our consultation program so that you guys have a pretty good idea of what 
you know what it, it really is about and how you know how we can help you with the you know um, passing these audits so I'm going to introduce Josh here real quick Hey Josh, we can't hear you. Specialist, or something. Can you start can over. You? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. All right, great. Sorry about that. Uh, my name's Josh Jaywook. I'm a business development specialist here at Associated Research. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about our applications consulting service. Um, the reason that we did implement this um, service is to kind of mitigate um, you know our customers uncertainties you know, with not only instruments but electrical safety testing in itself um, and one thing I really want to want to stress about our service here is you know everything's customized specifically towards each individual customer um, their specific challenges needs um, you know their DUT so everything all the training will be focused towards essentially what you guys need to improve um, within your electrical safety testing. And our four, you know, main touch points for our tests, uh, our service is knowledge, validation, uh, productivity, and safety. Um, I know Sai had kind of touched base on these a little bit, but you know, with knowledge is just, you know, training your operators, um, you know, giving them suggestions for improvement um, in order to ensure they're um, in order to ensure that they're following best practices, um, you know, with their testing, you know, setting parameters correctly, um, applying to, you know, specific standards. Um, and then in terms of validation, I know Syed spoke to you guys about the IQOQ uh, documents. And, you know, I do have um, sample, sample documents of those if you are interested in that. I can um, send those to you and speak with you further if you just leave a little comment here for Brittany. Um, I'll be make sure to touch base with you guys. And then um, in terms of productivity, um, you know, improving automation um, to help increase your throughput, um, you know, in your production line. Um, and then safety, you know, making sure that operators and um, your customers are safe um, when it comes to your products and testing your products. Um, this chart here, I know Sai touched base on a little bit also, but you know, ultimately we want to make sure our customers um, have the confidence with their testing and everything is safe and effective, um, and ultimately risk um, limit the risk of any you know implications for failure, fines, litigations, product recalls, um, uh, losing safety marks. As you can see here. Um, with our implica implications for failure, um, you know, it's a lot of fines, litigations, and stuff that, you know, just plays a lot, a burden on, you know, your organization, essentially. And then what we have here is our different plans. We have our starter plan, which is all online, essentially a webinar like this, constructed um, directly towards what you guys are looking for. Um, and then we have our professional plans, um, which we have a one-day plan, a two-day plan, and a four-day plan, uh, which we would have our applications engineers come on site and actually um, visit your location and train you hands-on. Um, you could either do a training track here or a validation track or both. Um, so it's kind of up to you. And like I said, um, you know, customize specifically towards um, each of our customers' needs. So Basically, I would, I would, I would speak with you, and you would, you know, give me the, the logistics of what you're looking for, um, and we'd be able to construct something for you guys. All right, and that that leads me to the next poll question here. I think uh, side will come back for that. Thank you, guys. All right, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you, Josh, for providing this. Uh, great information on our consultation program and uh, here's our first poll question of today and it basically this is the last thing we're going to do 
And the question is, when does OSHA pay a visit to your organization? So take a few minutes to answer this. All right, Sayan, we had 18% yes. percent, 18 percent say yearly, 9% say quarterly, 64% said only when an employee files a complaint, and 9% said never. All right, thank you, Brittany, for sharing the results again. All right, thank you guys for participating in our poll question, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, OSHA will only pay, a visit, at least from what we've, uh, you know, uh, learned and, you know, uh, seen and experienced, OSHA has only paid a visit to organizations if somebody has launched a complaint with OSHA. Otherwise, they don't just show up uh, randomly. So that was the correct answer, and I'm, I'm glad 64% of you got that right. And for those, uh, you know, who got who said yearly and quarterly you might want to check and see and we're also going to you know double check on this but from, we're pretty sure that OSHA only interferes when there is a complaint launched by somebody so that kind of leads us toward the end of our webinar and um, um, we're going to leave some time open for questions uh, Anthony on the chat line will be more than happy to answer any questions for you guys on the material being presented and if it's something important that you know um, if it's a question that we feel will benefit everybody I'll be more than happy to answer it if Tony can call it out and meanwhile I want to say uh, I want to point you guys to our website uh, for resources you know just visit us online and we have a lot of educational resources uh, including these webinars that are being archived and recorded and uh, a lot of other presentations white papers, uh, you know, quick start videos, guides, application notes. So, you know, feel free to reach out to us or email Brittany. Do join us for our next webinar, which is uh, uh, scheduled for Wednesday, September 13th, 10 a.m. Central Time. And uh, the subject is Leakage Current Testing 101. Again, a very important subject for those who are performing leakage current testing or are required to perform leakage current testing. We will go into a lot of details about, you know, what this test is all about. We're going to show you some examples, some cool videos, and, you know, educate you uh, so that you are uh, much more efficient when it comes to performing the leakage current testing. Um, again, you can contact... Uh, yeah, go ahead. We're good on the questions line. Okay. So, um, yeah, whenever you're... Okay. All right, thanks, thanks, Sonny. So it looks like uh, we don't have any questions uh, on the material today. Obviously, do keep in mind that this is very important stuff that we talked about. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, reach out to us directly. Um, uh, check out our website. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us again today and bearing with the, the audio issues that you experienced. We do apologize for that. Um, we'll try and improve, uh, you know, every time we uh, conduct these webinars. Um, this is your host, Syed Abidi, live from Lake Forest, Illinois, signing off. And you guys have a great evening, morning, afternoon. Thank you.